So Shiku, could you highlight what was the, what is a typical pathway yes. that a person with diabetes navigates in yes. a low resource setting? I don't think there is a typical pathway. Um, I think I would describe it as a series of Ds. So as soon as a patient gets this diagnosis, it sounds like doom and death to them and it takes a long time for them to accept that they have diabetes. And after they come to that realization and acceptance, they then have to start taking new medications, the second is drugs. And it's hard to access the drug, some of them may not be available at the nearest pharmacy and where they are available they may not be affordable. And with the diagnosis also comes a new diet, the third D. And um, this diet that is recommended for people living with diabetes is usually more expensive than the normal food that the family eats. Um, and this has bu budgetary implications for the family. Uh, it has logistical implications. Do they prepare two meals every, every time? And this can be very difficult for, for the patient to navigate through. And finally, they are told that you have to see a lot of doctors because it's not just diabetes, there is the complications of diabetes. And they are told you have to see a foot doctor, a heart doctor, a kidney doctor, an eye doctor. So much as ophthalmologists, we want the eye checkup to be up there. It's really very low on the list of the Ds that this patient has to navigate through. At a health system level, what are the major concerns when it comes to the treatment of diabetic retinopathy? At a health system level, there are many challenges. So the first one is just the people to, to deal with the disease. There is a shortage of practitioners who can deal with diabetic retinopathy. We may have ophthalmologists, but they may not have the skills that they need to provide the treatments. Uh, but they, I don't think there's anywhere where there is enough ophthalmologists. So we, we need to get in more retinal specialists and we need to put in more skills at the training level to get every new ophthalmologist coming out with some skills. Uh, in terms of the staff that's needed to treat the patients, the lasers, the diagnostic equipment, the OCTs, the cameras, all this costs a lot of money and it's very difficult for a hospital to accept to buy a piece of equipment that's just for the eyes that costs so much and something like an OCT which is becoming an integral part of the care for DR is really expensive. Um, then the financing, so the cost of all these treatments, whether it is the procedures for diagnosis or the medicines that the patient needs, the laser procedures, all that costs a lot. It costs a lot for the hospital to procure and stock up with those consumables and that cost is passed on to the patient. Uh, but the last, the other thing is just the massive number of specialists that are needed uh, to take care of the patient, whether it's the retinal specialists, whether it's the other comorbidities, because a lot of times when patients come to me, for example, with diabetic retinopathy, their, their sugars are out of control, their renal function is bad. And this, this has major implications on a hospital having those specialists all available in one, in one place. So those are some of the challenges that the health system is experiencing. Everybody is struggling to get the right model for their environment and for their patients um, to deal with diabetic retinopathy. And there are several models out there that are being tried out. One of the simplest things to try is just to link up with the diabetes clinic where your eye clinic is located. And that's usually where people start. And amazingly, even that has not been uh, modeled to an efficient, in an efficient way. So just getting the diabetologist within your facility to send the eye patients, how that flows, what happens once you find they have disease, that's one of the models that, that people are working on. Another model that I have seen in Kenya is where there's a mobile van that's equipped with lasers and um, sterile facilities for giving injections that's driven to where uh, people with diabetes have gathered together, uh, probably screened by a local ophthalmologist, 
and the specialist will then go there and provide all the treatments. And I think this model is, is working well because they, they get access to a highly specialized uh, ophthalmologist and all treatments are done in one, one location. How often this can be done, again, is a challenge. One of the models we are trying in Rwanda is where we go to the natural hub for people with diabetes, so the Diabetes Association in our, uh, in our situation. And we go there once a month and uh, we just screen everybody who presents there. And because it's an ophthalmologist going down there, we go with all the equipment. We make a diagnosis on the spot and we advise on what treatment is needed. We, we are not able to provide the treatment at the association clinic, but we provide transport for the patients to then come back to our hospital and access the treatment. Be, besides the treatment models, there are other things people are trying. So we are running through the College of Ophthalmology of East Africa, a short skills course where existing ophthalmologists come for one week to Rwanda and in that week, we train them on how to give injections, how to do laser, how to do a good indirect examination. And uh, it, it makes it possible for them to then go and, and give those basic treatments when they get home. We are also trying to integrate CPD so that ophthalmologists provide CPD for general practitioners. And during those sessions, I educate them on what are the referral protocols that exist out there. All these are different things we are doing to try and make sure that the, the person with diabetes is getting the right care at the right time. But I don't think there's one model that fits and works everywhere. As a key decision maker in a low resource setting, what are the priorities for establishing services to prevent blindness from diabetes in the next decade? I think if we are to win this battle against diabetic retinopathy, we need to prioritize several things and the first one has to be at the patient end of things. We need to educate the people living with diabetes to be aware that the eyes are part of the complications that they will uh, have to deal with. And um, just the culture of regular eye checkups is something that needs to be ingrained into them. We need to educate the carers, the diabetologists, the general practitioners, so that they too are encouraging uh, the patients to come for regular eye checkups. As you know, if we get them early, we can stop all those blinding stages, which are the ones that cost a lot of money. So I think education will be really important. And that's one end. On the other hand, we need to have the service centers that can provide the care that they need. There's no need of us educating them and raising awareness if there's no one to provide service at the other end. So we do need to have, like I said, at least one facility in each country that can provide specialized care at all levels of diabetic retinopathy, from the laser all the way to VR surgery. And the tricky part will be now how you link those two ends. And I think everybody's still trying to get those models, but I would prioritize those two things. Thank you very much.